Uh, thank you very much, Maggie. And welcome everyone uh, to uh, tonight's uh, presentation. Our topic uh, is advances in AFib management and stroke prevention. Uh, tonight is uh, February 29th. Uh, it's Leap Day. Happy Leap Day, everyone. It's also the last day of National Heart Month. So I think it's very fitting that we talk about this very important topic um, during the month of February. So again, uh, the topic tonight is advances in AFib management and stroke prevention. But I'd like to focus, if you would, uh, on some very recent and exciting um, dis uh, management uh, changes in our uh, approach to patients with atrial fibrillation. I'd like to focus on AFib ablation and left atrial appendage occlusion tonight. Now, under the uh, topic of advances in AFib ablation, uh, two um, recent uh, you know, changes have occurred in the field, which really have revolutionized in a large degree how we approach patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, the first is the use of high power, short duration, conventional radio wave energy, otherwise known as radio frequency uh, ablation. And the second is a, a new rel recently FDA approved energy form uh, referred to as pulse field electroporation. Just as a quick review, uh, atrial fibrillation is the most common cardiac rhythm disturbance that we encounter uh, in cardiology. It's, real, it's due to mic uh, multiple micro short circuits involving both the right and left upper chambers of the heart as shown in this a cartoon. Um, however, in the vast majority of patients with atrial fibrillation, the initiators of these short circuits, in, in other words, the triggers that lead to the short circuits that eventually cause atrial fibrillation, are typically uh, reside in the left atrium, as shown here in those little yellow stars. And more specifically, in areas that border the four pulmonary veins that enter the back wall of the left upper chamber. The tissue that is envelops around the four pulmonary vein ostea or entrances of the left upper chamber, that electrical tissue is the most active in people with atrial fibrillation and appears to be the cause or the triggers of AFib in over 90% of patients. In, cardi in cardiac electrophysiology, which is a subsection of cardiology that is focused on the management and treatment of cardiac rhythm disorders, we exploit this um, biology and we target these areas anatomically when we ablate atrial fibrillation. The approach in the in management of patients who are undergoing atrial fibrillation ablation is to do encircling lesions around the openings if you of the or the ostea of the pulmonary veins as shown in this diagram in order to essentially trap or fend invading the rest of the left upper chamber and causing atrial fibrillation we're essentially quarantining hundreds and hundreds of potential triggers with creating these encircling lesions that are in the back wall of the left upper chamber we avoid the pulmonary veins and avoid damage to those veins by staying wide enough to be only in the left up atrial tissue. We're not in the veins, we're in the left atrium, but we're hugging the veins to allow for minimal disruption of the rest of the left upper chamber. Now this technique is popularly known as pulmonary vein isolation. And this approach and use of radio wave energy has been FDA approved and standard of care in electrophysiology laboratories around the country for over a dozen years. However, and, and, and over those dozen years, I should say, pulmonary vein ablation has been proven again and again to be the cornerstone of any ablation therapy for AFib. In fact, this recent meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, basically combining lots of trials of atrial fibrillation ablation with the use of 
radio wave energy, and also cryoablation, another form of energy, compare, using pulmonary vein isolation targeted approach compared to non-pulmonary vein targeted approach, the results were, are significantly better when one uses pulmonary vein isolation. Less than 30% recurrence rates of AFib in patients who undergo PVI versus over 50% recurrence rates if they don't get PVI. And that's if you have either paroxysmal, which is relatively short-lived, or persistent, relatively long-lived episodes of atrial fibrillation. So again, pulmonary vein isolation is our cornerstone when we bring patients for, under, for this procedure. The new, the new exciting development in the field of radio wave energy, though, is the advent of high power, short duration, using novel ablation catheters, which can even achieve better results than we've had before. I won't bore it with you with the uh, details, but there is a lot of complex engineering, biomedical uh, technology that has in, improved irrigation tips to avoid charring and allow for a better transfer of energy from the tip to the, ener to the uh, surface of the um, heart. Improved temperature monitoring to allow for us to better gauge how much power we should be delivering to achieve results um, on the at, the at the tissue level. A higher signal resolution so we can better uh, aim our catheters and map more elegantly and, and more precisely. And a, more imp most importantly, the actual power delivery with advanced technology that allows for up to 90 watts of power in four second bursts. Typically up to now, we've been giving up to 50 watts uh, or less, uh, but 90 watts with very short duration, four seconds, allows for even better delivery and more uh, durable lesions with uh, improved time efficiency, allowing us to shorten the time period when we're in the heart and minimize um, potential uh, complication. The, the study that led to FDA approval for this technology was recently published uh, in our one of our leading journals, the Journal of American College of Cardiology, and it's called the QDOT FAST trial. And what they showed in the results was overwhelmingly good success rates, 86%, which is even better than the previous meta-analysis that I showed you with almost 30% recurrence rates. This was 14% recurrence rates. Uh, 60 with less, less time uh, on the table, approximately 60 minutes of total procedure time, which also translated to 71% less use of x-ray and overall 47% shorter ablation time inside the heart. Very, very, very uh, encouraging results. And uh, this technique of high power, short duration, radio frequency ablation, we have um, long adopted in our laboratory at Capital Health uh, Regional Medical Center and uh, really is considered uh, the uh, mainstay of treatment for many of our patients with AFib who are undergoing pulmonary vein isolation. Even more recently has been the advent of pulsed field electroporation ablation, where we use multi-electrode catheters, not single tip catheters, as I showed you earlier, that can deliver very rapid and uh, brief pulses of electrical current in multiple locations simultaneously, essentially giving a single shot ablation to allow for or nearly a single shot ablation to allow for a circumferential lesion around the pulmonary vein ostea. Uh, this is relatively new technology. Uh, the, the, the time course of these lesions is not four seconds as shown earlier, but it's measured in nanoseconds. And the uh, uh, current is, is rapidly on off, on off with each heartbeat for just a few heartbeats. And the, and the, and the, and the lesion is complete. My uh, electro electro my uh, elect, sorry microscopically under electron microscope, what we've seen in um, in studies is that uh, the tissue is uh, due to these very high frequency in short bursts of voltage is, a, is something a phenomenon known as electroporation where essentially little holes are are created 
in the cell membranes of the tissue adjacent to those electrodes on the catheter. And these little uh, pores, if you will, or holes or pores in the cell membrane uh, create a leakage of the interior cell substances, which renders the cell uh, enable, unable to conduct electricity and eventually become non-viable. What's uh, uh, in a cartoon fashion form, what's essentially happening in this, with this technology as shown on the right is that uh, you have a normal cell that then um, undergoes the electroporation uh, electrical field, which creates pores, as you can see in the, in the middle, pores in the cell membrane, which allow for leakage of internal cell substances. And then eventually cell death is shown on the lower right as, as more cell substances leave the cell, leaving the cell empty and unable to, con to hold a current. Um, as, as it normally would. Um, the other incredibly uh, exciting part, part, uh, part of this technology, uh, pulse field ablation, is that while we are doing make, creating injury to the electromyocytes or the muscle cells of the heart, as shown in the uh, here in the gray tone um, uh, under a, under ablated zone, nerve cells, which are different, uh, have a different anatomy, a cell anatomy than a heart muscle cell, vascular smooth muscle or adjacent esophageal smooth muscle are preserved. They're unaffected by this electrical current. The electrical current is very specific to the heart cells and spares non-heart cells that may be in uh, adjacent or even in the middle of the, of the force field. What this translates to is less damage if it, or no damage, I should say, to adjacent nerve cells. So phrenic palsy, which is a, a dreaded complication, it's often seen in cryoablation of, uh, not often seen, but sometimes seen in cryoablation uh, where the diaphragm may be uh, uh, unable to move or paralyzed from due to the nerve damage adjacent to the heart. Esophageal uh, injury, um, ulcerations, um, sometimes worst case scenario, uh, fistulas, the esophagus bordering the, the back of the left upper chamber as a dreaded complication causing bleeding and, and, and can be potentially life-threatening uh, when rarely, rarely seen. Uh, it seems to be spared by this uh, energy form and vascular smooth muscle, for example, adjacent coronary arteries or coronary veins that may be adjacent to the back of the left upper chamber seem to also be uh, protected. And that's all very encouraging and has been borne out in, in clinical human trial. Um, there's, you know, some of the recent studies that have come out uh, over the last just few years. This is a very recent technology. Um, this, this particular paper was published in uh, 2021 and it reviewed three uh, re uh, early trials of pulse field ablation and looking at 12 month or one year outcomes, showing that this under safety and efficacy of this um, technique of pulmonary vein isolation, that the safety profile was nearly perfect. Only a very small fraction of a percent of patients uh, had any kind of issues uh, during the procedure. And many of those issues were actually catheter, uh, sorry, correction, a sheath-based and delivery system-based, not energy form-based. Um, in other words, bleeding, pericardial effusion, and vascular injury at the groin really have more to do with the sheath uh, that the doctor inserted into the patient to deliver the ablation catheter, not the ablation catheter necessarily itself. But uh, no esophageal damage, no pulmonary vein issues, no phrenic nerve issues, um, very, very, very good, very good data. Um, and on the efficacy side, much like uh, we, we saw with high power short duration, uh, we see around approximately 84, 85% one year efficacy free of freedom of atrial fibrillation uh, which 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 um, equates to a, approximately the same as the 14% recurrence rate we saw with the high power short duration. So you get, in, at least in these initial trials, the same benefit and potentially more safety with pulse field ablation. More recently in 2023, two pivotal trials were published, which led to FDA approval of this uh, exciting uh, therapy. Uh, the pulsed AF trial um, and the ADVENT trial. Uh, 
which were published in circulation and the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the late summer, uh, sorry, spring and late summer of this past year, and eventually led to FDA approval of post-field ablation. Um, F, uh, we are in the process at Capital Health Regional of build, uh, trying to build out a, our new our new laboratory with post-field ablation as part of that um, as part of our in our part of our new toolbox. And I'm looking forward to having that for our patients in the very very near future. But this is uh, being slowly uh, rolled out throughout the country, and something you may hear or read about. Uh, and we're very excited about it uh, ourselves. Now, what else about catheter ablation of AFib that I'd like to mention, in addition to making people feel better and, and eliminating uh, their atrial fibrillation, it appears that uh, atrial fibrillation ablation uh, has been well recognized to having other benefits in subsects of patients. And in the Castle AHF study that was um, published um, over a dozen years ago, um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, patients with congestive heart failure and reduced heart uh, ejection fraction. Uh, in this study, the median ejection fraction of the left ventricle was 32%. Uh, mo vast majority of the patients had defibrillators because of their history of congestive heart failure. Uh, all these patients had atrial fibrillation and underwent catheter ablation and uh, radiofrequency catheter uh, or cryoablation. And what they found in this trial was very, very striking that uh, as shown in the upper uh, right-hand screen, uh, uh, the combined death or, or heart failure hospitalization uh, rate was significantly lower. So the probability of being free of those things was higher as shown in the graph in the ablation group compared to a randomized population, half of whom underwent conventional medical therapy versus ablation for atrial fibrillation. So ablation appears to, AFib ablation in this pa patient population appears to reduce significantly death and, and heart failure hospitalization uh, among heart failure patients, even those who already have defibrillators. More importantly to me, you notice that while the curves separate quickly within the first year and continue to separate throughout the five-year follow-up period, the latter half of the, of the time period as shown in the lower graph is the separations are really accountable or are striking by improvement in mortality. So in other words, the first half of the follow-up was mostly related to decreased hospitalizations, but after the first two years or three years, the improvements were really mostly in terms of reduced mortality. There's many interpretations of this, but while nobody feels that ablation itself saves lives, it's possible that by avoiding medical therapy, by undergoing a non-pharmacologic treatment for AFib, such as pulmonary vein isolation, allows patients to avoid some of these drugs, which may have toxic long-term effects and lead to reduced survival. I think that's probably an accurate interpretation. So as a result, there, and as the authors conclude, significant reduced mortality and heart failure hospitalizations, in, but also mortality alone was seen in patients undergoing AFib ablation in patients with congestive heart failure. So and this is this has allowed us to feel more comfortable sent, bringing patients who may have weak heart muscles to our procedure lab because we know that we're really making not only a benefit to their quality of life, but potentially their quantity of life as well. So that, that really, uh, um, you know, so in, in a nutshell, kind of ends my brief discussion about new advances in AFib ablation. Uh, the doctor is in. Uh, we are available, ready to go at a moment's notice. Uh, it's a it's a it's a rare day that one of our doctors is not performing an AFib ablation um, at one of the hospitals that we work at. Um, it's a very common procedure. It's become uh, our team is quite quite experienced. And when I say our team, not just the doctors, but the nurses the invaluable, the remainder of the valuable staff, um, uh, med techs, um, uh, map uh, engineers um, from the mapping company, uh, uh, x-ray technicians, and of course our anesthesia colleagues <clears throat> really form the, uh, the, the basis of the bulwark of our team uh, that helps get the patients uh, safely on and off the table and home, usually on a same day basis. It's, uh, we've been, um, 
performing these procedures as outpatient procedures for several years. And a typical patient will come in during the morning, have their procedure and be home after lunch. And uh, it's a, and they're very, very uh, satisfied uh, with, the, with, the, with their results. Uh, the second topic I'd like to talk about tonight it, under the topic of advances in AFib management is a focus on left atrial appendage occlusion for stroke prevention. The biggest and most dreaded uh, issue or complication related to atrial fibrillation is strokes. Uh, the most common cause of, stro of, of preventable stroke in the world is atrial fibrillation. It's not the only cause of stroke, it's the most common cause of stroke. And it's preventable. Uh, atrial fibrillation, by, by uh, addressing um, potential thrombus that occurs in atrial fibrillation, which I'll get to. Uh, AFib has it's been well recognized. The history, a history of AFib increases one's risk of stroke by five times unless addressed. By addressing the stroke risk, that risk goes down to no more than the average population. So this connect, this heart uh, brain connection, if you will, between uh, patients in patients with atrial fibrillation and the risk for stroke is is significant and. Depending on one's risk factors um, and, uh, and characteristics, the risk could even be higher than above 10% per year. Um, and, and that is, uh, again, the mechanism is thrombus or blood clot that originates in the left upper chamber where atrial fibrillation occurs, which then can dislodge, embolize, and travel through the bloodstream and create <clears throat> an occlusive uh, uh, clot uh, pre uh, preventing blood fl uh, flow in an area of the brain that the, the blood clot lodges um, through the circulation. Um, and unless the patient presents to an emergency room within a few hours and is able to get clot busting medications intravenously to alleviate the blood clot and restore normal brain function, usually within the first few hours, the brain uh, will die, that part of the brain will have irreversible damage and uh, a stroke will have occurred. And it's often with permanent results, which is, can be quite devastating. Uh, a mechanism here is, uh, is thought to be due to impaired atrial contractility seen in AFib. So during those microcircuits that are occurring in atrial fibrillation, the left upper chamber is not beating normally. It's getting multiple electrical messages from multiple electrical short circuits, causing the muscle in the left upper chamber to quiver or fibrillate, not beat normally. That impaired contractility leads to uncoordinated myocyte or muscle activity, leading to stasis or blood collections, which then lead to increased risk of thromboembolism or uh, travel, passage of blood clots through the bloodstream. Again, uh, at left atrium seems to be the, the, the culprit here. And most, most specifically, uh, just, like, like, just like with the triggers of atrial fibrillation that is, uh, initiate AFib, so does the blood clot that initiates the stroke occur in the left upper chamber. But in, unlike the, in, in a fib ablation where the electrical triggers are in the back wall near the pulmonary vein uh, openings, in, in stroke, in blood, with blood clots, the area in question is more in the front part or the front and side of the left upper chamber called the left atrial appendage, which is a little region, small region of the left upper chamber that is basically an outpouching of the, of the up, uh, left upper chamber and the, hence the word appendage. Um, and that's where blood can often become more static and little micro microclots can form. And it's thought that over 90% of stroke causing clots that come from the heart form in the left atrial appendage. And much like in the case of pulmonary vein isolation where we exploit the biology to create a treatment, so here have we in electrophysiology exploited the anatomy to create a solution. If more than 90% of AFib causes for, uh, are triggered by the pulmonary veins, that's where we go. If more than 90% of strokes are, are caused by clots for, uh, init, originating in the left atrial appendage, that's where we're going. And where, what are we doing? We are cre creating, a, we, we like to create a seal for, of this left atrial appendage if we can. Now, this is a movie showing what I'm talking about. This is this is a, in a real patient, and what to orient everybody it, with atrial fibrillation, and to orient everybody, uh, what I'm showing here in is the this 
is the left upper left atrial is this large black area. Uh, you'll see the mitral valve, which is the valve that connects the left upper chamber to the left lower chamber uh, around six, seven o'clock. And then around four o'clock is the left atrial appendage with a blood clot that's quite visible inside that you can see rocking back and forth in the left atrial appendage. This is not the same patient, of course. <laughs> this is from a cadaver, but it shows the same phenomenon uh, when opening up the left atrial appendage a black blood clot was seen. And this patient had a history of atrial fibrillation. Um, and so what we like to do is exploit this anatomy and seal off, if you will, using percutaneous catheter technique, seal off, wall off, if you will, or, or, or fence off, as, I use, as an expression I used earlier in ablation, this area and prevent any blood clot that might form from passing into the main left atrium and then to the rest of the body. And the device that has been um, FDA approved for this purpose is called the Watchman. And this is a, a, a expand a enlarged view of the current generation a Watchman Flex device that we have at Capital Health Regional Medical Center. It is as it comes in multiple sizes and is custom sized for that for the patients left atrial appendage anatomy. It is delivered through a, a, a sheath delivery system uh, as shown here in the, in the blue sheath. Uh, and it's done under both ultrasound and x-ray guidance uh, in the operating room. As I mentioned, it comes in multiple sizes. We have up to six sizes. Um, and they, each of these are very soft, made by very soft uh, metallic uh, 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 frames that are very uh, 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 expandable and can fill in uh, that left atrial appendage osteum with a, a thin fabric overlying that prevents a blood clots from traveling in between, but allows for nutrients and oxygen in the bloodstream to pass through to um, nourish the uh, left atrial appendage uh, tissue. Now, when we, um, when we, this is a movie to show how we do the procedure. Uh, the patient is brought to, uh, anesthetized and under general anesthesia, a small IV catheter is placed in the femoral vein. We avoid arteries. We go through blood veins, much like with ablation. That catheter is delivered over a wire system to the right upper chamber, which is where the veins anatomically connect. We then puncture through a very thin muscle membrane called the septum to the left upper chamber, much like we do in AFib ablation. And then using an over the wire system, we advance the watchman sheath, which then allows us through a soft rubber pigtail catheter to advance safely into the left atrial appendage. We then withdraw the pigtail catheter, advance the watchman device, withdraw the sheath to allow the watchman device to expand partially and then fully into the left atrial appendage. We then disconnect it from the sheath, remove the sheath, the, and the watchman is left in place where over the next few weeks, it will endothelialize and the heart lining will form over the watchman and completely allow for sealing of the left atrial appendage. The procedure is typically 60 to 90 minutes in length. Patient is under anesthesia and then is awoken, stays for a few hours while the anesthesia is worn off and goes home the same day, much like an AFib ablation. In the clinical trial, clinical F flex trial, I should, that was the clinical trial that led to FDA approval of the sec current generation Watchman device, 100% of subjects were found to have complete left atrial appendage, or I should say effective left atrial appendage closure at 12 months. That doesn't get any better than that. Everyone was closed one year out from the procedure. The safety data, so that's the efficacy data. The safety data, uh, nearly 0% issues with, with only uh, half of a percent having a potential uh, ischemic stroke, which is, may have been related to the procedure or their atrial fibrillation. But, um, but zero death, zero pericardial effusions, and zero device embolization in the trial. Embolization means that the device moved out of place and dislodged and had to be um, 
would have had to have been uh, retrieved uh, surgically, 0%. How about other trials, lar perhaps larger studies that looked at the, some of the uh, overall F uh, uh, clinical benefits of the Watchman uh, treatment? Well, there's a very important study that was published um, just a few years ago um, called the Prague 17 trial, which looked at a four-year, it was a four-year study looking at outcomes after uh, Watchman uh, treatment in patients with atrial fibrillation uh, versus uh, standard modern blood thinners. Prior studies had looked at older traditional blood thinner called warfarin, but today in uh, we most patients, the vast majority of patients no longer take warfarin. We, we have more, we have better treatments called Eliquis, Xarelto, or Pradaxa. And in this trial, the Watchman Flex device, as I showed you earlier, was compared in a randomized fashion <clears throat> to these modern uh, direct oral anticoagulants. And what they found, as shown on the right-hand side of the screen, is that overall, the primary endpoint of combined stroke, TIA or mini stroke, systemic embolization or blood clots in other parts of the body, cardiovascular death, bleeding, or other complications from the procedure in those who underwent the procedure. There was a trend towards benefit in the patients who got left atrial appendage closure or, or watchman device as shown in the, in the brown curve as being lower incidence compared to the blue curve with the DOAC. Or, or direct oral anticoagulants. However, if you if you look, that was there was definitely some benefit, but it did not quite meet statistical. You know, it was considered non inferior uh, uh, to the blood thinner. wasn't powered to uh, study enough to show um, significant superiority, but it was certainly non inferior. However, on the right side of the screen, I think is probably more illuminating. Under stroke, if, when they looked at just stroke and mini strokes. There was no difference in the curve, suggesting that the Watchman Flex was equivalent, not better, not worse, but equivalent to conventional blood thinners. However, in the lower right screen, the significant bleeding risk was, or major bleeding risk, was significantly lower in those who underwent the Watchman procedure versus those who maintained blood thinners over the four-year period. So I think the take home message here is compared to modern blood thinners, the Watchman provides equivalent stroke and TIA protection, but, but with much less major bleeding risk. And that leads to my second uh, study that I wanna review with you, which was actually a retrospective cohort match trial. That means they look backwards they're using Medicare database from 2015 to 2019. The investigators look backwards using looking at thousands and thousands of patients, uh, nearly 20,000 patients who underwent, half of whom underwent the Watchman procedure during these four year time period. And <clears throat> the other half were treated with blood thinners, either approximately half of those were coagulant uh, agents. And these <clears throat> two groups, while they weren't prospectively randomized, they were retrospectively matched. So they had the same age, sex, and other characteristic uh, profiles to make them an equivalent uh, uh, comparisons. And what they found, as shown on the right screen, was improved survival, as shown on the y-axis, or another way of saying it, reduced mortality, in the patients who underwent the LAAO, or left atrial appendage occlusion, either female or male in the upper colors in the, in, with the solid lines versus uh, getting blood thinners as shown in the lower two colors with the dashed lines. Or, um, so the, and so while this was not a prospective trial and while this was only, this had a mixed group of patients with warfarin and non-warfarin and maybe some of that would have been would it may possibly may have been different had the results might may, the results may have been different had they only looked at novel agents only hard to know um but what the certainly what one can conclude from this is that they're compared to blood thinners 
Watchman implantation is at least associated, if not a cause effect, associated with reduced death rates in both women and men when looked at at four years. And I think, you know, much like the ablation story where uh, mortality benefit was often seen in the, after a couple of years in the Castle HF study, here with this Medicare database, it's kind of a similar story after after a few years out, not having to be exposed to blood thinners may have some benefit in terms of less bleeding complications, some of which may be life-threatening bleeding or either in the head or in the stomach or the intestines, um, which, which potentially could cause reduced survival in a large group of patients. We looked at in, in, in several thousand patients. After the one question that I often get, and I and I wanted to add this slide is, after the watchman, can I stop my blood thinner? And the answer is yes, but not right away. Um, we we currently have two um, protocols for patients who undergo the watchman flex procedure. The traditional option or protocol is a short duration, a short, a short amount of oral anticoagulation. So that would be one's blood thinner before, they, they were taken before the watchman, like a warfarin, an Eliquis, a Pradaxa, a Xarelto, for 45 days, followed by a, a Plavix and aspirin, which is otherwise referred to as DAPT, or dual antiplatelet therapy for six months, and then ultimately just a baby aspirin beyond that um, time, uh, seven and a half month time period. The, new, the second protocol, which is a relatively new option, only really FDA approved uh, this past fall is a immediate DAP only, it's basically skipping the first 45 days of using oral anticoagulants and going straight to just Plavix and aspirin for six months. And then if a repeat shows no problem with the watchman and well healed, uh, a baby aspirin after that. And for many patients who are having issues on blood thinners, bleeding, usually bleeding related issues, or concerns of potential bleeding on these blood thinners and hence the reason to get a watchman, um, we feel that the option two might be more beneficial to many of those patients. But notice there isn't a third option that says no blood thinner. That would be a research, uh, that would be not FDA approved, that would be off-label, uh, at least in this country. Uh, perhaps in other countries, uh, people are doing that, uh, but in this country, um, you need to be on some form of a thinner for at least uh, six months um, in order to allow for that endothelialization or healing in the line of the lining of the heart to go to envelop the watchman and separate the artificial surface of the fabric from the bloodstream to uh, and prevent potential fabric related blood clots um, from occurring. Um, so that's the, that's the answer there when when asked, uh, can I stop my blood thinner right away? The answer is. Not right away, but yes, eventually. The watchman is an alternative to blood long-term blood thinners in a, patients with AFib and a risk for stroke. So in summary, the watchman flex, and the, now we have the watchman flex pro, which has an additional coating on the surface for additional protection against blood clots that just was FDA approved uh, last month uh, are indicated for, uh, and, and we have available at our hospitals are indicated for patients with increased stroke risk and are suitable for oral anticoagulation in the short term, but have an appropriate reason to seek a non-drug alternative in the long term. So I wanna thank everybody for your attention. We've talked uh, briefly tonight about advances in atrial fibrillation ablation and specifically focusing on new techniques of pulmonary vein isolation. We've spoken about left atrial appendage occlusion with the Watchman Flex device. Um, these are both readily available uh, to patients uh, with, from the cap, with the cap, through the Capital Health Cardio Electrophysiology uh, program that uh, uh, I work at. I happen to enjoy uh, working with three very esteemed colleagues who are all, uh, in addition to myself, uh, expert in these uh, techniques and are uh, ready and willing and able to uh, see patients and discuss these procedures and perform any of these procedures
uh, at our Capital Health Regional Campus. And I want to make a special shout out to Drs. Scott Burke, uh, Michael Rosengarden, and Dr. Zabir Badi, uh, my colleagues uh, within the Capital Health uh, Cardiac Electrophysiology uh, Department. And with that, I'll open the floor to questions, and I thank everybody for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read you some questions that were in the chat box, okay? How do we ensure success of ablation, especially those older 65 plus? Any lifestyle recommendations? Well, during the procedure, we have criteria for both of these procedures, actually, ablation and watchman. There are strict mandated criteria that are proven in clinical trials and are part and parcel to the procedure where we uh, will we can um, predict the, the success rates of these procedures. So specifically in AFib ablation, we test our circles and and, our, and we make sure that there's no there's something called bidirectional conduction block where no electricity can go in or out of those areas that we've encircled uh, with our catheter a procedure. We will pace on the inside, we'll pace on the outside. We give drugs to called isoproterenol or adenosine to stress the cells to make sure that they are truly, there's true uh, electrical block and those triggers cannot escape. Uh, with, that, with, those, with those measures, the success rate, as I as I showed you, uh, are as high as 85% in patients undergoing a, a first-time AFib ablation. Um, as far as other things you can do as a, as patients to help ensure success long term, uh, in a summary, things that are good for your heart is good for us. So staying uh, uh, trim, reducing uh, uh, any weight if you're uh, obese and you have a body mass index. Over 30, we would recommend uh, weight loss uh, strategies, uh, treatment of sleep, obstructive sleep apnea. If you happen to have a sleep apnea um, is also helpful since that's a known uh, initiator of AFib. Uh, controlling one's hypertension. And if they have a high thyroid or if they have diabetes, controlling their sugars or their thyroid levels are very important in these patients as well. Um, and just staying in good cardiovascular shape. Um, is something that, you know, in, and with a good diet exercise program is important. And then lastly, avoiding certain uh, triggers that may be involved in certain patients, such as excessive alcohol consumption, caffeine consumption, uh, or the use of um, certain medications that have an agent called pseudoephedrine might be something to be, you know, to, to avoid in patients who are prone to uh, uh, frequent atrial fibrillation, at least in the, in the beginning. If they're already on an antiarrhythmic agent, like a, you know, a medication prior to the ablation, we'll sometimes keep their medications for a few months, but we ultimately will stop those medications under, after the ablation. And I say a few months because we'll, we'll tell our patients we need to give them a few months to heal. There's microscopic inflammation that occurs in both radio wave energy and also pulse field ablation where the tissue is a little in microscopically inflamed where we do our, our procedure. And that inflammation can rarely, but sometimes cause AFib by different mechanism than the pulmonary vein triggers. And once that inflammation recedes, which can sometimes take up to three months, um, they may have, a patient may have an occasional AFib burst, but, with, so, but we don't really count that for the first three months. We, we kind of dismiss it as a potential uh, just inflammatory AFib and so all, this, all those success rates that, I, that I've mentioned to you uh, in the studies that go out at least a year or up to four or five or 10 years, uh, they always discount that first three months. The, that's, we, we start the clock at 90 days after an AFib ablation. Much like we start the clock for a watchman in stopping their blood thinners at approximately six months. To allow okay. For, yeah. Okay, next question. I am a 38-year-old woman I'm concerned about having AFib because my dad had it young and I occasionally have random arrhythmias. I've also had an abnormally high heart rate for years and never found out why. My Capital Health affiliated primary care doctor offered to send me to one of your cardiologists for testing. My question is, do you offer any type of home monitoring that goes longer than 24 hours? Yes. Or, okay. The, 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 or, quick answer, the quick answer is yes. Okay. Uh, we, so for, so for those in, on online, um, this is a, who may not be familiar with this question, 
uh, in addition to the person who asking the question, who is evidently very familiar with this question, having lived it with her dad, um, AFib is a diagnosis that needs to be made by an EKG. So one, if one has palpitations or irregular skipped heartbeats, that in and of itself does not diagnose somebody with AFib. There are other causes of skip beats. There are other causes of irregular uh, 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 sensations in one's chest. So the EK, this, it, but they are characteristic of AFib. But to make to 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 clinch a diagnosis, you need an EKG showing atrial fibrillation and those microcircuits on the EKG pattern. Um, EKGs come, come from in different come in many forms. They, when we think of EKGs, we typically think of a conventional paper, twelve lead EKG done in a hospital or a medical office. However, today with modern technology, we now have wearable devices, Apple watches, for example, Fitbit watches, uh, some of the new Garmin watches, I believe, have EKG um, monitoring capability. The Apple Watch is FDA approved. I don't think the other ones are yet um, for this purpose. Um, so the, they're, not, they're not toys. They're real EKG monitors. In addition, our practice, our office, as the questioner asked, can also prescribe short-term monitors that can be uh, essentially um, uh, uh, placed on top of the chest. They're very small, um, almost like a little sticker that, put, that, that sticks to your skin and has embedded uh, like a patch and is embed, has embedded uh, circuits and a battery and a Wi-Fi antenna that allows for continuous EKG monitoring and uploading into a cloud-based system. So no more tapes, no more wires, no more clunky batteries, uh, just a little patch that is in, that's placed on top of your left breast. And after a week or two or three or four, um, the patient can, can as, depending on what was prescribed by the physician, the patient simply um, peels off that, that monitor, that little sticky monitor patch, if you will, from their skin and mails it back to the company where it can be processed. And we can then meet them in the office and go over the results. And that that these EKGs are absolutely just as good as anything we can get in a hospital setting or a conventional EKG and makes the diagnosis of AFib. So once, once we make the diagnosis, then we can discuss treatment plans, whether it's medical therapy or ablation therapy or watchman therapy, but we can't make any of those conversations. We shouldn't have any of those conversations until we have an ironclad diagnosis based on an EKG. And the question for the, from the questioner was, can we provide that monitoring at our offices? And the answer is yes, we can provide that. Okay, next question. What are the symptoms of left atrium AFib? Different for men versus women? Not different from men versus women, but different from people from person to person. Uh, there are a high percentage of patients with AFib who unfortunately have no symptoms. Well, you could say fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, depending on how you look at it. I say unfortunately because they may not know they have AFib, may not be being treated with either blood thinners or some other protective agent like a watchman and God forbid, end up in an emergency room with a stroke. So those are the ones I actually worry about the most, the ones who don't have symptoms. But the ones, the vast majority of patients do have some form of a symptom and they can be very um, mild or they can be very severe. And it very depend, it's very individual um, and person to person. And they can range from palpitations, rapid heartbeats, irregular heartbeats, uh, fish flopping kind of sensations in the chest kind of heartbeats to shortness of breath, to dizziness or weakness, to um, um, chest discomfort, tightness, uh, or some combination of all the above. Um, but palpitations would probably be the most traditional or, or irregular heartbeat or irregular pulse would be the most, probably the most common that we hear. Um, but it for, and some can be very severe and debilitating symptoms where patients, uh, Oh, I should also mention if you have a history of congestive heart failure, it can often lead to, it can sometimes lead to congestive heart failure, exacerbation as, and fluid retention as well. Um, and so occasionally patients, are, their symptoms are so debilitating, they end up in the emergency room, but the vast majority of patients, uh, the symptoms are tolerable. They can work through the day with it. It disturbs them. It affects their quality of life, but it doesn't stop them from their daily activities. And it's typically treated as an outpatient um uh, issue. Okay. Um, next question. Can you still have a stroke if you are taking blood thinners? Uh, the answer is uh, unequivocally yes, but it, um, 
but it depends on the reason for this stroke. Um, there are, as I mentioned, the most common reason for stroke and uh, is atrial fibrillation. And people with atrial fibrillation have five times the risk of stroke compared to the normal population. It is not the only cause of stroke. Patients can get uh, other uh, strokes for other reasons. They can have arterial um, aneurysms. They can have uh, uh, pl uh, plaque from cholesterol uh, that can block the vessel, much like patients with heart attacks in their coronary arteries. They can have essentially brain attacks from atherosclerosis of the cerebral arteries um, and the carotid arteries, so and the vertebral arteries. So they're, they're and those just to name a few. Um, but um, and then of course patients who have a or de and of course there are patients with AFib who don't know they have AFib because they're asymptomatic and it may come and go and by the time they get to the hospital the AFib may not be present but the stroke has already occurred so we don't always diagnose patients with AFib uh, every time they come in with a stroke nor does every patient with AFib destined to have a stroke if patients who are once we identify somebody with AFib. We, we rapidly uh, de uh, determine if they're with their risk profile for having a stroke. And th that risk includes um, the following variables, uh, age over 65, history of congestive heart failure, history of hypertension, history of diabetes, um, female gender, uh, history of peripheral vascular disease, or history of a previous stroke or mini stroke. If one has any of those or, the, or a combination of the above, we typically treat them with blood thinners, if uh, with the exception of just a female alone. If, 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 but if a female uh, alone uh, or a male with none of those other risk factors, uh, we probably would recommend, like in other words, someone under 65 uh, without hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease, peripheral vascular disease, previous heart stroke or mini stroke, we might tell them to take a baby aspirin instead of a, a or, or maybe nothing. And, but but the, but most patients with AFib have one of those or a combination of those risk factors. We'll then start initiate blood thinners right away and talk about a watchman down the road if appropriate. Um, that's that's job one with someone with AFib. Uh, but there are other causes of strokes, and if, if someone with who does come into the hospital with an unfortunate stroke, and when they can, and we can't find the cause of a of their stroke. In other words, they've had the te the battery of tests. They don't have aneurysms. They don't have blockages in their vessels. Uh, there's no history of AFib, nor is there any EKG evidence in the hospital of AFib. We'll often recommend what, uh, something called an implantable loop recorder, which is a little device that, much like the external monitors that I mentioned in the earlier question, this one is inserted like a microchip under the skin. We do we often implant those in the office, um, and they have a battery that lasts up to four years and can survey someone's heartbeats continuously and look for AFib, that, like an occult AFib that may be causing intermittent, uh, intermittent blood clots and potential stroke. And when we see AFib in those patients, we rapidly initiate treatment for that to prevent the second stroke. Okay. Can patients be able to come off of blood thinners permanently after ablation? The very good question. The answer is depending on their risk factor profile that this has been looked at. And if you, those, those same risk factors that I mentioned earlier, if they have maybe zero to one of those risk factors and they've been in sinus rhythm for, and, I, and this is a little bit arbitrary, but I would say a minimum of six months, probably a year, um, you know, we've been in the practice of stopping their blood thinners. Um, if they have two or more of those risk factors, despite the fact that the ablation was successful, I've been in the practice of maintaining blood thinners. My concern is that they may at some point develop recurrent atrial fibrillation. They may be the unlucky 15%, if you will, that has recurrent AFib with the modern technology that we have for ablation. And their first symptom of recurrent AFib could be, a, could be potentially a stroke. And so I don't want them to have that ever happen to them. So I think depending on the risk factor profile, more than the success rate of the ablation is the is the is the determining factor of whether one has a long need for blood thinners or watchmen or not. Okay. Does LAAO stop AFib? No. It prevents blood it prevents the passage of blood clots 
to the rest of the to the left to the left upper chamber to the rest of the body through the bloodstream. It does not because of its location in the left atrial appendage, which is in the front and side of the left atrium left atrium, and not anywhere near the back wall of the left upper chamber where the pulmonary vein triggers occur. It would have no effect on the over ninety percent of people with atrial fibrillation in terms of preventing AFib. No. Okay. Um, what and, and by the way, the converse is and the con. This wasn't asked, but the converse is also true. That um, nor would ablation of AFib do anything to the left atrial appendage unless we abate unless we happen to ablate around the left atrial appendage, which is generally uh, frowned upon. Because uh, and and when patients do get ablations around the left atrial appendage due to uh, triggers in the left atrial appendage, which is uncommon then we almost always recommend watchments for those patients because we've now uh, injured the left atrial appendage and caused decreased contract, potentially decreased contractility and more blood stasis and more risk for thrombus than even before. So we don't use ablation to prevent blood clots and we don't use watchments to prevent AFib. Um, what if you can't use aspirin? Um, you mean after a watchman, I presume. Um, then we would, if you can't use an aspirin, then we would probably, after the required time period, then we, we would maybe forego it. Um, but, uh, so that would be that answer. I think during during the um, first six months when patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy, you know, the FDA protocol is a baby aspirin and Plavix. And most vast majority of patients are able to tolerate a baby aspirin. Not a full dose adult strength, uh, 81 milligrams. Okay, what is the biggest difference between ablation and Watchman? And is it decided on a case-by-case -case basis? How long has Watchman been around? The biggest difference between ablation, which is a catheter procedure just that is a, a trick targeted at a f um, pulmonary vein triggers of atrial fibrillation, and preventing AFib recurrence. And the Watchman, which is a filter, essentially a filter that blocks blood transmission of blood clots from the left atrial appendage. The difference is that an ablation is, is, is a rhythm control strategy to maintain sinus rhythm. And a, and a, and a Watchman is a targeted uh, treatment to prevent strokes, but has nothing to do with one's cardiac rhythm. You could be in AFib, you can be in sinus rhythm, and you can get the same benefit of the watchman in either case. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question, but that's, I think I did. Um, was there a second part to that question? Uh, no, but I have another question. Um, what about cardioversion? I am 81, is it too late for these procedures? Cardioversion is a treatment that is uh, an ex uh, uh, basically an external shock delivered to a non-invasively to a patient under sedation to temporarily restore sinus rhythm in someone who has AFib or atrial fibrillation. Um, it is not a cure for AFib. It's just a temporary fix to put somebody back into sinus rhythm when they're in AFib. Uh, it, is, uh, it doesn't prevent a patient from Flipping one or uh, flipping back into or converting back into AFib at any time in the future, so we don't we don't we consider that a temporary fix for someone who might be very symptomatic and needs to, you know it needs to be put back in sinus rhythm more rapidly, um, but it's not a it's not a long term treatment for AFib. Okay, if someone has been in AFib for several years, is ablation still an option? That's an excellent question, and I did not show that slide, but uh, I will tell you uh, that atrial fibrillation ablation, pulmonary vein isolation, with even our best technologies that we have today, which we're very excited about, works best in people who have relatively recent or infrequent AFib. It does not work as well, and, and, or, and the studies have well shown, borne this out, in people with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation as defined as AFib that's been in existence for over 12 months, or in patients who are AFib um, for more than six months, 
and they have to be shocked out each time. They don't convert on their own. Uh, the, in those categories of patients, um, I, I and many doctors will often typically use a drug treatment strategy for antiarrhythmic drug strategy first, perhaps with a cardioversion to restore sinus rhythm, maintain sinus rhythm, and try to essentially reverse the clock, if you will, and get them back to their heart being used to being in normal rhythm for some short period of time, and then do the ablation with more success. But if, if you take a patient with longstanding AFib over 12 months or sh more than six months, but had to be shocked out, um, then um, you can expect success rates no more than 50% with AFib ablation. That, that, that high number I showed you earlier was in selected AFib patients with the relatively recent or short duration AFib that's, you know, all, in, in a best case scenario, less than seven days with uh, episodes that last less than seven days, which break on their own. That The term for that is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or patients with what's called early persistent AFib less than six months long that needed to be shocked out. In those two categories of patients, the success rates are better. And you may ask why, and the reason is over time, if a patient is left in AFib, those little triggers that at first were confined to the regions around the pulmonary veins, anatomically and biochemically, the heart starts to remodel, if you will. And those similar triggers then begin to form in other spots in the upper chambers, both right and left upper chambers of the heart, and, the, and there's more targets and more areas that we have to ablate. And the success rate is, as a result starts to, starts to, starts to dec decline. Okay. We, may miss, we may miss some of these triggers because there's just too many triggers to choose from in these longstanding patients. Okay. Is there a type of candidate, age, weight, that is better for one type of ablation procedure over the other, i.e. high power, short duration versus pulsed field? No, uh, they were, uh, I think the ideal patient is ideal for either technology. Uh, a, a morbidly obese patient, a patient with sleep apnea, a patient who has uncontrolled hypertension, a patient who has poorly controlled diabetes um, is not gonna do as well. And a patient, the opposite is gonna do better. A thinner, um, doesn't have to be thin, thin, but not morbidly obese. Uh, a patient who doesn't have sleep apnea or if does is controlled with CPAP, a pay, uh, which is a nighttime mask device that is treatment for sl or obstructive sleep apnea, a patient who has well-controlled hypertension or diabe and diabetes and or diabetes and, and or thyroid disease, those patients are going to do better. So medically tuned up patients will do better than, a, than a, someone who's not medically tuned up. Okay. I just want to interrupt here for a second. Um, it's a little bit after seven. We have several more questions. How many more questions would you like, Dr. Salberman? Oh, we can go a little longer. Sure. Okay. All right. If you need an ablation, should you try to wait for pulse field ablation to be allowed? That's an excellent question. Um, I would say no. I don't think it's necessary because our success and our safety profile with high power short duration is so, is so impressive that I feel very comfortable advising patients to have their procedures now rather than wait for their AFib to become more chronic in nature, and then they may not have as, as a high a success rate with the procedure. Okay. Can a patient with the, AFib... In patients with AFib who were contemplating an ablation, I would say if you're a candidate for an ablation now, uh, I would say have the procedure and uh, rather than risk the ablation, AFib progressing and then not having as good a result if you waited longer. Can a patient with AFib have both procedures done together? That's an excellent question. The answer is yes, but I don't recommend it. Uh, there are places that do uh, combined AFib ablation and Watchman procedures. The reason I don't recommend it is because of the, uh, that issue of a little bit of swelling and inflammation, microscopically, albeit, but sometimes a little more than microscopically, that can form after an ablation which may obscure some one edge of the left atrial appendage um, near the left pulmonary veins. And that might affect the proper sizing of the Watchman device. Um, and, as, and when that inflammation or edema rece rece recedes over the next few months, the, that you might have an issue where you have a gap or a leak 
around the watchman that borders the left pulmonary veins. And that would be very bad because then you don't have a complete closure or seal of the left atrial appendage. So what I recommend is if both procedures are being contemplated, I recommend having the ablation procedure being done first, waiting three months for the inflammation to completely resolve, and then having the watchman implantation done after that time period. Fluttering versus AFib, are they treated differently? Is fluttering in the right atrium? Well, well I think the, the question is atrial flutter uh, versus atrial fibrillation. So atrial flutter is a single short circuit heart rhythm that is a kind of the cousin, if you will, of atrial fibrillation and often seen in the same patient. And the watchman and uh, device is currently uh, labeled or indicated for patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, and the ablation technique that we use for atrial, not a flutter, but there, unless the patient has both. Um, and the, um, uh, as far as the, um, uh, ablation goes, the ablation strategy for a fib, uh, sorry, a flutter ablation is to attack the short circuit, not the pulmonary vein triggers necessarily. So we map the atrial flutter circuit and we uh, ablate tissue that is involving that particular circuit since it's only a single circuit. 70 to 80%, well, I should say around 70 to 75% of atrial, all comers in, with atrial flutter will be in the right upper chamber the circuit will be located in the right upper chamber. About 20 to 30% will be in the left upper chamber, and then a very small percentage in both chambers. If they happen to be in the left upper chamber, we will often do an AFib ablation at the same time, even if they've never had a history of AFib, because we know that there's a high crossover in those patients who may one day develop AFib, even though they've only had left atrial flutter. If they have right atrial flutter only, and that's all we map and that's all we ablate, we we'll usually avoid doing the uh, AFib ablation. If they happen to have a history of both atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, then we will attack both during their procedure. We would prefer them not having to come back for a second procedure. Okay. So I, did, I, I didn't talk about, and the, catheter tech, the catheters that we use for atrial flutter ablation are the same identical catheters that we use for AFib ablation, the same ones I showed you. In fact, pulse field ablation has been studied in atrial flutter and, and there was recently an article showing uh, success rates with that. Uh, so it, um, we use both radio wave energy, we, we use at Capital Health Regional, we use our radio wave energy catheters, the same that we use for atrial fibrillation, we use for atrial flutter as well. Okay, can you have a watchman if you have a pacemaker? Can you yeah. have the watchman if you have had an atrial ablation 25 years ago, and now no right bundle branch? Yes, yes. You can have a watchman if you have a pacemaker or defibrillator or any other implanted device. You can have a watchman if you've had a previous ablation. Remember I mentioned we usually like to wait three months, but beyond that three month period after an AFib ablation, you can have a watchman. The answer, the answer is yes for both. Do you recommend? Well, no, I, let me let me just say because this wasn't asked. The people who should not have a watchman are people who have a blood clot in their heart already. We are not going to put a watchman in somebody who has a blood clot in their left atrial appendage for fear that during the process of putting the watchman in the patient, we may dislodge an already existing blood clot and cause a stroke that we're trying to prevent. Um, so. What we'll often, what we always do as part of our protocol is when the patient comes to the operating room for their for their watchman procedure, we will, and after they've been put under anesthesia, but before we start the proceed, or my proceed, the watchman procedure, a, a transesophageal echocardiography is performed, which is the gold stand, which is an ultrasound down the mouth, uh, a probe uh, that's inserted through the mouth down the esophagus, to image the left atrial appendage. It is the gold standard test for ruling out a blood clot in the left atrial appendage. And we do that test uh, uh, all uniformly before a watchman procedure to make sure there's no blood clot. Even though a patient may have already may have sworn that they never stopped their blood thinner before the procedure and may have sworn that they've been completely compliant, I believe them. Uh, they just, they may be just that, or, or, if, for whatever reason, they, they had to stop their blood thinner for whatever, or they were never on a blood thinner, whatever reason or a combination of reasons, 
If we see a blood clot, we don't do the procedure. We, we wake them up, we send them home with a, some other blood thinner combination that they may not have already been taking or some alteration in the dose that they were taking, and we'll bring them back in six to 12 weeks for their procedure after sufficient time to melt and, and dissolve the blood clot has occurred. Do you recommend taking blood thinner and Multac for AFib? So Malt, for those in the, uh, on the call, Multac is one of several antiarrhythmic drugs that has been used for suppression of atrial fibrillation. It's one of those many drugs that AFib ablation was compared against in those trials I showed you, which shows that the ablation is superior to antiarrhythmic drugs. That said, Multac is a very safe, relatively safe agent, has so, some side effects like every drug potentially can, but is, is, is commonly prescribed for this for treatment of both atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Um, it, <clears throat> it is, um, it, it is a, uh, it, so that's what that is. Um, it has nothing to do with the need or not need for a blood thinner. The need or not need for a blood thinner has everything to do with one's risk profile uh, that I spoke about earlier. That risk profile is sometimes known as the CHADS VASC score. CHADS VASC is an acronym for congestive heart failure, hypertension, age over 65, diabetes, uh, stroke, f female gender, um, stroke or mini stroke or female gender. And, VASC, and, and so if you have a combination of any of those, some or any of those risk factors, that's, that's the decision to be on a blood thinner, not whether you're on Multac or not. Okay. Is the Watchman covered by Medicare or maybe Advantage plans? Yes. So is ablation. These are everything I've mentioned to you tonight is FDA approved. And everything I've mentioned tonight is approved by CMS, which is the government organization for Medicare and Medicaid. If AFib is controlled medically, is it still advancing from an ablation success rate? So ask the question one more time. If AFib is controlled medically, is it still advancing from an ablation success rate? So I guess it depends on what you mean by controlling. If you mean rate controlling with a beta blocker or a calcium blocker, but you're still in AFib, but you don't feel it as much because your heart rate's not as fast, then the answer is you're gonna you're gonna become a persistent AFib patient and the success rate with the ablation is gonna decline with time. If you mean control with an antiarrhythmic drug that keeps you in sinus rhythm majority of the time, then you will not, and, and, it, and, it's, and the drug is working for you, then you're still a candidate for, you're still an excellent candidate for the ablation. So, that, so the success rate or not success or the failure or the, or the success rate with the ablation has everything to do with your heart rhythms, not what drugs you're taking. And uh, if your heart rhythms are majority sinus rhythm, going into the procedure, you'll do better than if it's majority AFib. Since the Watchman filter does, since the Watchman filters, does it get clogged with clots? Yes, it does, but that's okay because the clots won't escape the fabric. So in some patients, the whole area of the appendage may fill up with blood clot. And some patients, they'll never have a blood clot because we've seen that with serial TE studies. But, um, but in either case, no blood clot's gonna go into the main left upper chamber and go through the bloodstream to the brain and cause a stroke. It's gonna be confined to that area for, for the rest of that patient's life. And especially after the fabric endothelializes after that first initial few week, a uh, few months, and then it's complete, it's, then it's fully sealed off. Cause it's not just the fabric that's holding it back. Then you have heart, heart tissue, it, itself that's holding it back. Where are ablations performed since St. Francis closed? Good question. We perform since St. Francis closed in December of 2022, so over the past year and a few months, we have been performing our procedures at Capital Health Regional Medical Center, sometimes referred to as the formerly known Helene Fold Hospital, but now for the last over decade known as Capital Health Regional Medical Center, which is located on Brunswick Avenue in Trenton, New Jersey. It's a few miles away from the old St. Francis Hospital, uh, uh, just uh, located about a block off Route 1 um, in Trenton. Okay. 
Are there any problems with the percutaneous puncture wound when performing an ablation? Does it close over and when? The access point for ablation is the same access point that we use for the watchman. So that, that movie that I showed you for the watchman with the sheath in the right femoral vein, we use a similar uh, approach for right, sorry, for atrial fibrillation ablation. In both cases, uh, patients' uh, 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 veins and skin fully heal after, um, honestly, after just a few days. And we, we do at our hospitals, we often will put closure devices, which are little plugs, if you will, little collagen plugs, which is a natural substance under the skin to help uh, maintain uh, you know, lack of bleeding, prevent bleeding, I should say, in patients with blood thinners. Um, and over the next few weeks, those collagen plugs will dissolve and everything will be just fine. Um, there's usually, a, if it, in a patient undergoing ablation, uh, like I, in both cases, patients are up and about within a few hours and go home the same day. Uh, they can they don't have to, there's not pro, there's no prolonged bed rest like in the old days, and um, and it's a very rare patient that has any va major vascular issues besides maybe a small bruise um, to to speak of. Okay, do you ever employ any? Uh any experience with the other competing medical device products that's alternative to Watchman? I understand that results are as good, if not better. The Watchman has been on the market in use longer, available to US cardiac surgeons, electrophysiologists sooner. And would you consider another product? There's one other FDA product on the market, which I did not speak to. It's, it is an excellent device. It is manufactured by uh, another company called Abbott, and it's called the Amulet. And it is FDA. It was FDA approved uh, approximately or uh, less than a year ago. And we don't have it available at our hospital. It's been a slow release across the country. Um, many places still don't have them, uh, but and it doesn't have the uh, long track record that Watchman does, which has been out for almost a, almost a decade. Um, but uh, it's an excellent uh, device and. The advantage of the amulet uh, in clinical trials is that you can avoid a lot of the, uh, the need for blood thinners uh, immediately uh, post-procedure. So for a patient who absolutely 1,000% cannot tolerate any form of any thinner, even a, a small dose of Plavix and a small dose of aspirin, um, those patients may be appro appropriately uh, a wait for us to get the amulet, which we don't have yet at our hospital. But the vast, vast, vast majority of our patients, uh, we don't have that issue with, and we have a, a long experience and track record and, and, uh, and success rate with the Watchman device. Are people with atrial fib with or without treatment with an ablation at higher risk for congested heart failure? Um, the answer is, if, if someone has AFib longstanding, they probably are at somewhat increased risk for congestive heart failure. That is true. And um, if that happens, that's a symptom of AFib. You know, shortness of breath, uh, fatigue. I mentioned those things earlier. That if, 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 that, if that is occurring and the patient is developing signs of other signs of congestive heart failure, weakening of the heart muscle, retention of fluid in the ankles, or the lower extremities, um, there's some laboratory signs of atrial uh, of congestive heart failure as well. Uh, those patients, we would be very uh, uh, aggressive about getting them out of AFib. And as I showed you with the Castle HF study, uh, they with ablation, those patients can be not only made better uh, symptomatically with less heart failure hospitalization, but they actually their mortality is, or, or their life expectancy can be can improve significantly with the AFib ablation as well. And that's on top of defibrillators. Okay, and I think this is the last question. Are there any life-threatening situations that have occurred while you did an ablation? So every time we do a, a procedure at our hospitals, our doctors and nurses and techs are exquisitely aware and laser-focused on everything that's happening to our patient every second of every moment of the procedure. And what we're looking for is potential issues and complications. Luckily, fortunately, due to the ex expert work of everybody involved, it's a, it's really a team effort. 
Um, we are we rarely see issues that are would, that even approach anything life threatening. But when we do, we immediately abort, stop the procedure, and address that concern. What are those things that could potentially happen that could be potentially life threatening that would raise to this level um, that I have seen? And I think that's what the questioner is asking. Uh, bleeding around the heart, that sometimes referred to as a pericardial effusion can occur if, if, if one of the catheters or sheaths, uh, and this, by the way, everything I'm talking about can also occur in the Watchman or AFib ablation um, procedure, um, can, can cause a, uh, either a small tear or, um, or perforation of the lining of the heart. And if that happens, the blood that's inside the heart can leak out around and surround the outside of the heart within the lining, underneath the exterior lining of the heart, but outside the muscle, the beating heart muscle. And that space is called the pericardial space. And if the blood collection forms quickly enough, it can actually push on the outside of the heart, prevent the heart from filling and the blood and the patient's drop, blood pressure can drop dramatically and it's life absolutely life-threatening. And in those cases, we'll reverse blood thinners immediately and to prevent you know any further bleeding. And then if necessary, we will, uh, insert a drain percutaneously under the rib cage and drain that blood for that's out surrounding the outside of the heart uh, with immediate improvement of one's blood pressure and restoration of hemodynamics. Um, I've seen it. It's luckily very uncommon. It's less than 1%. Uh, I think I mentioned, I think I showed you a slide earlier that showed pericardial effusion was less than 1% in the um, pulse field ablation uh, uh, catheters as well. Um, so it's it's not unique to radio wave energy of catheters. It can also be seen in our in the newer catheters as well, and it's treatable. But it has to be recognized immediately and treated rapidly before the patient declines. Uh, the other potential life threatening uh, issue would be a uh, heart attack, I guess, uh, or from a, or a stroke from a blood clot that occurs during the procedure, either on our catheter. Um, uh, or from the tissue uh, that's been inflamed from the procedure that causes a blood clot on the tissue surface. Uh, luckily, we have we don't see that because we are diligent about administering blood thinners during the procedure uh, in the form of intravenous heparin, uh, titrated. Uh, every, every, we we constantly checking patients' blood uh, thinning levels in the blood. Uh, it's called a clotting time, and we're checking the clotting times during the procedure very frequently, and we're adjusting the amount of intravenous heparin to make that patient's blood three to four times thinner than, than normal. And that's uh, that seems to be, uh, and has been shown in studies, to be very effective in, in eliminating, or nearly, not completely eliminating, nothing's 100%, but nearly eliminating that th those risks of, of that. And then, and I have not ever personally experienced a patient, knock on wood, with a heart attack or a stroke um, during an AFib ablation or a watchman, but uh, in either case, it could, I guess it could potentially occur um, because of the catheters that are residing in the heart while we're doing the procedure. And then lastly, um, and this last one is really restricted just to ablation, not to the watchman, is, um, well, I could say, let me say second to lastly, this is restricted to the ablation only, is the esophagus. Uh, if if you, it's been reported that less than one in a thousand AFib ablations can cause fistulas of the esophagus, which are basically channels or connectors that allow for blood to escape the heart and go directly into the esophagus through a channel from burning a hole, th essentially with the radio wave energy. Um, pulse field ablation doesn't have that issue. It seems at zero percent risk. Um, a radio wave energy is less than one in a thousand because we monitor esophageal temperatures while we're, while we're doing the procedure. And if we see a fraction of a degree of, of Celsius rise in the temperature while we're, while we're ablating the back wall of the left upper chamber, we will immediately go off and move our catheter to a different location. Um, and with, that, with those precautions, we rarely have ever, and I have never personally witnessed an atrial esophageal fistula, but I've certainly read about them. And they are life-threatening and require emergency surgery to repair that esophageal uh, um, channel. Uh, so, uh, lastly, um, in this is restricted to the watchman, is device embolization. That could be potentially life-threatening if the watchman moves out of position and then clogs up one of the heart valves, uh, the mitral valve or the aortic valve, or potentially goes into the aorta and through the bloodstream into the aorta and then clogs up 
uh, part of the aorta. That could be very, very dangerous and require emergency surgery to retrieve the watchman and remove it from the body. Um, I have never personally seen that, um, but I certainly it's certainly been reported and it's very, very, very rare. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was well, very informative. Your, yes. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I want to thank everybody for your attention tonight and I, on what I consider a very important topic. And again, um, myself and my colleagues stand ready and willing to see anyone who may have further questions or concerns about their atrial fibrillation.